Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining me for this teaching for 2 Kings chapters 2 and 3. And just want to say a great big welcome to all who are joining online, which I think is all of you, group leaders, group members, admins, school program, uh, and anyone else who's watching too. Let me just go ahead and open us up in um, a word of prayer. Father God, um, just prepare our hearts tonight as we go through this teaching you have um, help me prepare with the Holy Spirit, Lord. And I just ask that you prepare our hearts to receive it. Um, just as we learn about these great prophets, Lord, just help us understand how we can help grow your kingdom, Lord. And just um, if you stir any of that in anyone tonight, Lord, continue to um, just feed that to help that grow too. Um, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We pray in his name, Jesus. Amen. Sometimes good, sometimes confusing, sometimes bad, but never easy, change. After a 26-year career, I'm retiring next spring. Um, while I'm excited at what God has planned for me, I'm a bit overwhelmed by the upcoming dramatic change in my life. On one hand, no more tax season. Uh, I work for a company who did year-end reporting. But I'm also a little anxious as I wonder what I will do to fill my days. And I'm sure there'll be some anxiety along with excitement as my team transitions to a new leader too. Retirement is just one example of a monumentous change. We could add marriage, relationships, employment, injury, illness, death, and so on. Life is always moving. The clock keeps ticking. Everything has a time and a season. Every wind of change brings new challenges, learnings, and opportunities. And we'll we all respond and we manage change differently. One complex but familiar change to us all is that of leadership, like what I was just talking about. Just as I was saying earlier, my team will need to transition from my leadership to a new leader. When there is transition of leadership in government or businesses or sports or church, family, and even BSF leadership, or even in the classes here, that change can always be challenging for everyone. Second Kings chapters two and three tell a story of challenging leadership transition. God calls Elisha to follow the powerful prophet Elijah. Elisha receives the baton of leadership from his mentor. He's called by God to great responsibility, to affect the change in the hearts of people. But this assignment did not come without pain and a measure of resistance. As Elisha steps up and Elijah steps out, he loses his mentor. He is harassed by his peers. He's mocked by his enemies, and he's disheartened by powerful, corrupt kings. In fact, before God's supernatural confirmation of his role um, as a senior prophet like Elijah, Elisha's heart cries out. He says, where now is the Lord? Maybe you recognize that cry in your own heart as you face change in your life. Well, this week's passage in 2 Kings gives us a powerful reminder of how despite confusion and upheaval and hardship of change in a broken world, when everything seems to be going against God and his people, we can be absolutely um, certain of the persistent, relentless grace and long-suffering of our sovereign God. Let's look at this passage tonight in two divisions. First, grace-filled succession in chapter 2. And then second, grace-filled victory in chapter 3. So whether you're a trusted leader bringing change or a supportive community member receiving change, these chapters remind us that we are all conduits of God's grace through this change. So our first division, grace-filled succession. The people of the northern kingdom of Israel in the 9th century BC were no strangers to change. They experienced a split between the northern and the southern kingdoms. They suffered under 19 consecutive evil, greedy, murderous kings, and their nation was in a mess. At the time of Elisha's appointment to succeed Elijah, the northern kingdom was on the cusp of yet another leadership transition. The notorious wicked King Ahab died and his son Joram took over. And very soon it became apparent that Joram would follow the evil ways of his father. And yet in a striking parallel to the dysfunctional, ungodly generation of kings, God raised up a powerful, grace-filled succession of prophets. People who God 
graciously appointed to speak for him. So in verses 1 through 12, let's take a look at what we call here like the transition, right? So 2 King opens during the last days of Elijah's uh, prophetic ministry. He faithfully spoke on God's behalf for decades, calling out idolatry and injustice and challenging Israel to repent and follow God's commands. But now Elijah's time on earth was coming to an end. He was soon to be taken up to heaven in a whirlwind, as we read in chapter 2, verse 1. Elijah is one of only two people the Bible records that was spared from a physical death. Elijah was ready to pass on his mantle to his trusted apprentice, Elisha. And as we journey together for this last time, as they journey together at this last time, we get some insight into the relationship and the nature of this leadership transition. Let's not forget the benefit of hindsight that we have as we follow their story together. We know who Elisha will become. We likely have read what he will achieve by God's grace. But just for a moment, let's walk with this pair as they take their journey together from Gilgal towards Jericho. So these were challenging and uncertain days for sure. The people of Israel have faced forsaken God and his word and have chosen to worship Baal instead. Wicked, wicked rulers reign, spiritual darkness dominates. Elisha about to lose his cherished mentor and his friend. Elijah was known as one of the greatest prophets, and Elisha was recognized as his apparent successor. So in this time of transition, Elisha and the other faithful prophets are no doubt anxious about the spiritual state of Israel. They were losing their leader who spoke and acted with God's grace and authority. Would Elisha measure up? God's intended purpose for Elisha certainly required a single-minded commitment. And in these first 10 verses in chapter 2, the prophetic pair are on the road to Gilgad to Bethel, and then on to Jericho, and then to the Jordan River. Through their emotional and deliberate journey, we see Elisha's commitment to Elijah. And most importantly, Elisha's commitment to Elijah's God. Most scholars estimate Elisha spent six years as Elijah's understudy. Over this time, they developed an apprentice um, relationship, a model apprentice relationship, really one that we all should long for with our mentors um, and maybe even apprentices. Elisha referred to him as his father, and it shows really how close they were. So Elisha um, had formerly been a wealthy farmer. We heard about that, I think, a couple weeks ago. Scripture tells us he had 12 yoke and oxen, yoke of oxen. Um, in Second First Kings chapter 19, verse 19, it uh, quantifies his success in earthly terms. But one day when Elisha was working in the field, as we had read about, Elijah came up through his cloak around his shoulders. This represented a public invitation to step into God's call for his life. And incredibly, without discussion or even really argument, Elisha left it all behind to follow Elijah and become God's prophet. He burned his plows, slaughtered his oxen, said goodbye to his family. Elisha sacrificed a lot to follow Elijah, God. And, how, and now he was losing this security of Elijah's guiding presence. They have walked together a long time, but Elisha knew that he would soon be walking without Elijah. The community of prophets also seemed to understand that it was Elijah's time was ending and Elisha's time to come. Knowing the time was short, Elisha passed, Elijah pauses in their journey three times to ask Elisha to stay behind. Three times Elisha refuses. It seems like Elijah is testing him testing Elisha's commitment to his calling by giving him the opportunity to stay behind, to walk away from the difficulties that a, uh, this life can bring him. And the company of prophets of Bethel and Jericho seem to kind of know what's going on. They ask Elisha, do you know the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, says Elisha. Now, so be quiet. Elisha does not want anyone to distract him from, from what's going on here, from this mission he has. As he watched from afar, Elisha pursues his master and stays with him to the end. Elisha is utterly committed to Elijah. 
In verse 7, the two men arrive in Jericho and move to the Jordan River. When they reach the water's edge, Water's edge. Elijah strikes the water, river with his cloak, and the water divides. It allows them to cross over. When they reach the other side, Elijah asks Elisha, "What can I do before I'm taken up from you?" Can you imagine what Elisha is thinking and feeling at this moment? Maybe he was transported back in time to that moment when he first heard God's call, slaughtered those oxen, burnt the plows. Is the weight of responsibility landing heavy? as his beloved friend and mentor prepares to leave. Elisha knows the key to Elijah's ministry was not his charisma, but the power of the spirit of God. Someone once said, watch to see where God is working and then join him in his work. Elisha had watched God work in Elijah's life and followed him every step of the way. Now he is ready to take up the mantle and declare God's truth to a nation sliding further and further into idolatry. He refuses to be distracted by discouragement, disappointment, or doubt, or anything else that steps in, that anything else as he steps into the fullness of God's call. So Elisha answers Elijah's question. He wants a double portion of his spirit. Now, he's not greedy or seeking more popularity than his master. Rather, his answer represents his request to become Elijah's heir. At the time, you see, a father left his eldest son a double portion of his property and belongings. Elisha is simply um, asking or essentially asking Elijah and God for the spiritual power to fulfill his calling. He knows he needs God's power to do God's work. And God granted what Elisha requested. Elisha did nearly twice as many miracles as Elijah in his lifetime. Elisha, um, but, but note Elisha's response in verse 10. He knows God alone could fulfill his request. He tells Elisha if he were to be taken up, if he saw him being taken up to heaven, he would know that God had granted what he had asked. And so Elisha faithfully follows Elijah right to the end. He refuses to be swayed by politics or pride. And though Elisha could not know all that God was going to ask from him, he willingly commits to follow God. He steps up. And as they walk and talk, a fiery chariot with horses comes and takes Elisha to heaven in the whirlwind. Just like that, wow, he takes Elijah up. Elisha stands looking at the sky as beloved mentor Elisha. Elijah disappears from sight. How do you respond when God calls you to be an agent of change? When the task is huge and your resources feel small, do you shrink back or do you step up? What helps you focus on God's commission when everything seems like a big mess? Elisha was a different kind of man than Elijah. God did not intend Elisha to function as Elijah's clone. His ministry would be similar, but also different. Through God's spirit, Elisha would bring God's meshes of hope and restoration. The same spirit of God equips all the people of God to do his work. In his grace and intimate um, wisdom, God knows that Elisha and those around him needed to recognize God's delegated authority to prepare him for the work ahead. And so we can see this confirmation of Elisha here as we, in these verses 12 through 25, and we'll kind of this is the close of chapter two, and I kind of call it the confirmation. We had the transition, and now this is the confirmation. Okay, so first the confirmation at the Jordan in verses 13 through 14. A bewildered Elisha picks up Elijah's cloak that had fallen to the ground and asks, where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? But God does not leave Elisha guessing about his constant presence or power needed to fulfill his call. God immediately confirms Elisha's authority to his prophet. As Elisha strikes the water, the Jordan parts by God's power. He crosses over to start carrying out God's given work, the God-given work. Secondly, the confirmation by the watching prophets in verses 15 through 18. Um, here we have the, they recognize the spirit of Elijah had come on Elisha. Still perplexed about Elijah's disappearance, they send out a search party to look for him and against Elisha's wishes. And no surprise, they don't find him. God not only confirmed Elijah, Elisha's calling for Elijah's sake, but also that the others would recognize that he is God's messenger. Thirdly, the confirmation in the city of Jericho, verses 19 through 22. 
Next, God offers further proof that Elisha is his representative. The water in Jericho is polluted, causing the people to suffer and leave the land very unproductive. Um, God enables Elisha to purify the water and prove he's a man empowered by God. And fourthly, confirmation against his enemies, verses 23 and 25 through 25. So this gain of enemies mocked Elisha. God vindicates him by sending a couple of bears to maul the young men. While this response may seem really harsh to us, God underscores here the seriousness of rejecting his prophet and even really rejecting him. God's authority rests on Elisha and God wants his people to know that. So what did we learn from the transition from Elijah to Elisha by God's design? Well, the principle here is this. God graciously raises up people to speak for him. By nature, God is gracious. And that is our doctrine for the week, the doctrine of grace. This means, grace means God delights to bless people who do not deserve it. The Israelites persisted in resisting God, but so do we. Every human is so flawed by sin that we naturally to prefer, prefer to rule our own lives than to let God rule it. The rebellion that rises within us may shock us even at times, but it does not ever deter God. God does not love us for what we can offer him. God loves us so much that he showers us with undeserved favors and blessings, of which none of it has been earned. Did you hear that? What I said right there? We cannot earn God's blessings. If you think about it, God, God showered, um, showed grace to these rebellious kings in the kingdom of Israel by sending these prophets, Elijah and Elisha, to warn them and call them to repentance. They certainly did not earn God's persistent pursuit of him at all, but he did it because he loves them. And how does God show grace to you? I imagine you think of many ways. However, we can't talk about God's grace without talking about Jesus, Jesus Christ. The salvation that Christ offers is entirely a gift of God's grace. Jesus became a man. He died a death he did not deserve, he did not deserve to save us. We contribute nothing to our salvation. Jesus' righteousness is graciously attributed to us when we put our faith in him. And, and we have all messed up, right? We like mess up over and over and over. And we'll continue to mess up, just so you know. The world believes our only hope rests in the power of our, our own power to make things right. That's what the world believes. The world believes that those who stumble the worst are bound to remain in that gutter, the gutter of life. In fact, right, that's where they belong, right? The world believes that this life is it. You're, you, are, you are left with what you make of it, better or worse. But God, our God, he tells a different story. God extends his grace to us and others in more ways than we can ever imagine or even count. So I want to ask you here in a challenge question, what expression of God's grace to you leads you to praise and thank him today, right? God's grace is deeper, it's wider, it's bigger, and it's stronger than any sin that we have. And we can trust him. And I thought this was interesting. Elijah and Elisha are different as day and night. Or should we say fire and water? Elijah is the prophet who called down fire from heaven to defeat the prophets of Baal and then sent him into heaven in a whirlwind escorted by a chariot of fire. Elisha's ministry can be associated with water. His first miracle after parting the Jordan was to purify that water. In the chapters ahead, we also see where Elisha is remembered for pouring out water in Elisha's hands. We read how Elisha provides water to the king's army here in chapter three coming up. And he tells a leopard to go wash, and he causes the axe to float. Elijah was the forerunner of John the Baptist. He was an unapologetic hero who boldly stood alone for truth. He spent many years in solitude and didn't take a disciple until God told him to take and train Elisha. Elisha was more social and even tempered than Elijah. He lived in a city, liked to be around people. The city was known to have like at least 100 prophets in training during his life. Elisha was humble. He's an obedient servant who blessed those who turned to him. Remember how Elisha had to physically pick up Elijah's cloak to move forward and the authority in his new position? 
Perhaps God has been working on your heart, calling you deeper to help grow his kingdom. Maybe you feel inadequate, though, when you're called. I know I certainly have. Maybe even look at others like who are before you or ahead of you or even around you and you just say, I can't do it like they do it. Well, although their personalities and ministries are very different, Elijah and Elisha both knew God and experienced power in their lives, just like you can. God authenticated both their ministries and had a specific purpose for them. He didn't expect them to be exactly the same. The Spirit of God rested powerfully on both of them. Elisha didn't have to try and imitate Elijah's ministry. He didn't have to imitate Elijah's faith. Elijah's character Elisha's character and faith reflect Elijah's strong training of him. One of the most important roles of a leader isn't necessarily to gain followers, but to train other leaders to follow Christ. You're all unique with your own personalities, passions, opportunities, ministries, and gifts. But one thing remains the same. It is our united faith in Christ and his spirit that will enable us to live out our calling. So how willing are you to step up and lead when God calls you? Who has God raised up to lead you forward? Who is God, how has God raised you up to lead others? Wise leaders recognize the responsibility and the privilege of their call, but also their total dependence upon God. It's not about us. Into what circles of influence has God placed you? How are you responding? And let me ask you this. Where is a place you need to accept responsibility and move forward in faith? God supplies what his call demands. Elisha stepped up. The responsibility and the influence of a leader can determine whether community flourishes or fails. But God is generous. He loves to give what cannot be earned. He speaks, he calls, he provides. So, Let's move on to chapter three in our second division here. As Elisha steps up to leave for God's cause as a nation faces a military challenge. So division two is called Grace-Filled Victory. It's chapter three. So Joram becomes Israel's king and continues the evil and idolatry of his father Ahab and his mother Jezebel. A political crisis develops during this 12-year reign. Moab was a nation within the land of Canaan that was firmly conquered by Israel, Right. But Israel, so therefore Israel required the Moabites to pay a tax of 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams each year. But after Ahab's death, the Moabites are like, wait, no more. We're going to refuse to pay this tax. So Joram formed a military alliance with, with uh, the king Jehoshaphat and of Judah and the king of Edom to put the Moabites in their place. This was not a wise move on um, the kingdom of the king of Judah, right? Jehoshaphat. This was not a wise move at all on his part. And we also know that Joram did not seek any counsel from God in this matter. So on the way to the battle, Joram's army and their livestock are left without water. Joram does not take the responsibility for his part in the crisis, instead blames God. Let's look at verse 10, what it says here. It says, what he explained, exclaimed the king of Israel, has the Lord called us three kings together only to deliver us into the hands of Moab? Interestingly, it was evidently easier to blame God than it was important to seek God in this case. So as we move into verses 11 and 19, we see that Jehoshaphat recognizes the stress and danger and suggests they seek a prophet of the Lord for direction. Good idea. And guess whose name is mentioned? Elisha! One of Jerome's officers actually knows of him. He has a relationship with him, and he knows that God's presence is with him. At first, Elisha refuses to help, but eventually gives, gives in out of respect for um, the king of Judah, who is, uh, is, who is actually descended of King David. God speaks through Elisha, promising that the valley will be filled with water without wind or rain. The soldiers and the animals will have plenty to drink. Elisha also promises victory over the Moabites. God continues to clearly validate Elisha as a prophet. Also, God continues to graciously call people to recognize his power and to believe in him. And then we see the victory here in verses 20 through 27. Just as Elisha has predicted, the next morning, the water fills, the land is filled with water. The Moabite army wakes up to realize the three kings are ready to attack. 
And they kind of look out over that flowing water and under the rays of sun, the water looks red like blood. They wrongly assume the three kings turned on one another and slaughtered each other. The Moabites make their own move to plunder Israel and the Israeli army soundly defeats them as they come in. The Moabite towns are destroyed and the land is decimated. The Israelites return home having experienced victory that God declared on their behalf. Why would God do this for such rebellious people? Like you would think that he'd actually do the opposite rather than to do that, right? Well, he spoke through Elisha. He sent water for the thirsty soldiers and the animals. Why did he do this? The enemy was thwarted and God's people were delivered. God showed his strength on behalf of his people and not just to solve their problems. He revealed who he was because he longed his people to live as his people. That was the purpose. And that's the principle here too, or second principle is God graciously reveals his power and cause his people to know him. Think about your life. Think about this week. How has God shown you grace in specific ways that you've recognized this week? Maybe it's through change or whether it's challenges or triumph. God orchestrates our circumstances to call us to himself in all ways at all times. The God who demonstrated power through Elisha continued to through Elijah, sorry, continued to speak through Elisha. God's work continued when the workers changed. His diligence for the hearts of the people persisted, even as they continued to rebel. In what way you sense God's relentless and gracious pursuit of your heart? Think about that. Perhaps the conviction of sin. When we're convicted of our sin, it's really a blessing from the Lord because he's calling us closer in that. He's calling us out on that pretty much, right? With love and grace. Maybe it's an answer in prayer. Maybe he provides comfort in very unexpected ways. He pursues you. He's, he's hunting you down. He wants you, right? He wants to bless you. Receive that blessing. Receive it. And... So really, if you think about it, what are those ways then that you sense his pursuit of your heart? And then just kind of to wrap up here, I love this part. There's something that kind of struck out me um, in verse 16. So when God instructed the kings to make the valley full of ditches. So of course they come, they're thirsty, there's no water, there's no rain. And you know this is when Elisha comes in and the miracle of the water and all that. <clears throat> so it's just before they said there's no rain, the valley would be filled with water. Right, So God promises the valley will be filled with water. And this is a strange promise from God, like the valley would be filled with water. Think about this, though. God promised to send water to the valley, but they had to dig the ditches to catch what God would provide. They had to dig the ditches before the water was even apparent so they could benefit from it when it came. Imagine when the kings, kings returned from visiting Elisha and told their commanders to have the men go out and dig the dishes. That'd be hard to hear. They were probably near dead, dying of thirst. They're in the middle of the desert. They don't look forward at all to the work of digging ditches and dry ground that hasn't rained in forever, right? Yet this work is essential. Dig the ditches, he says, the trenches and some, some um, different Bibles. This demonstration is a principle um, that God wants us to prepare for the blessing he wants to bring, the grace he will provide, listening to him. We are to anticipate his working and get ready for it. Digging ditches was something the people of God could do. God didn't ask them to do more than what they were able to do. When God wants to prepare for a blessing he will bring, he gives us things that we can really do. So I want to ask you this, what, ditch, ditch, what ditches is God asking you to dig in preparation for his abundant blessings? What ditches do you have to do? What, what preparation is God calling you to do? And maybe you just don't see it, like, you know, to dry ground, Lord, why am I doing this, right? I love here what Charles Spurgeon, um, theologian from decades, probably centuries ago, says, he says, Act not on the mere strength of what you have, but in the expectation of which you've been asked. So 
when we think about this, you kind of boil down these two chapters. What does this reveal about God's heart? He's full of grace and compassion. He's generous. He is for us. He longs for more and more lost, weary, broken, rebellious people to be reconciled with him. God's unrelenting, ever-present grace pours out abundantly then and even today. Through Elijah and Elisha, God offered timely warnings, amazing displays of his power. God revealed his heart. He longs for the wayward people to come to him. He persistently extends grace to the rebels like us, right? He keeps calling and calling. And that has changed at all. He still raises up people to speak for him faithfully and boldly, even when their comfort unravels. God's voice cannot be silenced here. Mm -hmm. Now when people reject him or his messengers change, he sends, he equips people to boldly speak for him in a world that rejects him, our world. There, there are many messes in this world, messes in our churches, messes in relationships, messages, messes in our own hearts. Yet God's restoration plan cannot be stopped. His relentless grace provides so many opportunities to repent. He continues to speak to us and through us. He graciously reaches for us today and out to us today. Change is inevitable. God's presence is constant. God's grace flows in a steady stream. And may we respond to his grace with worship and obedience. May we step up when God calls us to speak for him. May we be faithful until, like Elijah, God calls us home. Let's pray. Father God, um, help us to be faithful and be obedient, Lord. It's with the power of the Holy Spirit that we can do that, Lord. Give us the desire in our hearts to follow you, to stand up, to step up, to be bold and courageous, Lord, on your behalf. Not that you need us to, Lord but to bring more people to see who you are, the loving Father who is relentlessly pursuing, digging deeper and deeper and reaching further because of his deep love for us, Lord. I just ask if you've laid it on anyone's heart tonight, you know, they can recognize where that, that ditch or that trench that needs to be dug and this preparation, Lord, and maybe they've been avoiding it. I'm just praying, Lord, that you give them the, the, the courage and the power to be able to dig that trench. Um, we thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. And we just ask a blessing over all those who are listening to this message tonight. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.